Uh, well, hi everyone. I'm uh, Ronnie Cohen. I'm the founder of Flow Live. And uh, I think just a quick background. I've been doing this uh, mobile infrastructure, mobile uh, building mobile operators in, in various places in the world since sort of the, uh, the late 90s. And, and really the background into what brings me this to the conversation is infrastructure in the mobile world and what's, what's in store for us in the future. Um, and what's happening now, what's going to happen in the next couple of years and where do we see sort of IoT devices, the evolution of eSIM as we've seen it. So I'll kind of touch a bit uh, on that, but feel free to ask any questions. I don't mind, we can have this even open. Uh, so, kind of our story, really, I, when I was thinking about this, uh, uh, really the story starts in 1992. Uh, obviously, it's got something to do with roaming, but things that happened. Linford Christie wins an Olympic gold medal, uh, decorated the uh, British sportsman. IBM creates a ThinkPad. It's the first time that we started modern slavery. This is when you start going home and starting to work at home in the evenings. And I think I enjoyed Wayne's World. I'm a bit ashamed of it as well, but I enjoyed it at the time. Windows 3.1 is launched. It gives me shivers to my spine still, because the next thing that comes to this, if you say, you know, like people have these association cards, what happened, uh, you know, what does this remind you of? This reminds me of the screen, uh, screen of death. So that's what uh, reminds me of uh, Windows 3.1, but it's a very important milestone. And actually, uh, Kurtzwill's uh, The Age of Intelligence Machine is published and uh, The Intelligent Machines, and this is really a, a milestone uh, book that actually has everything to do with what we're doing today because there's not one sentence that doesn't end with uh, we do this with AI, we're using AI. This is really the first um, you know, iteration of uh, modern-day AI as we see it today. It was the late 90s. What's all this got to do with 1992? The first roaming agreement was signed between Vodafone and, uh, and uh, Telecom Finland. And really, this is the first time that we, th we, we think this is the, the modern world. Wow, this is amazing. I can travel with my phone that I have in one country and go to the other country and start using this. So roaming is great. This is the first sort of uh, GSM concept I was uh, I was in my early 20s and I thought this is quite amazing. I'm starting in the, in, starting in the tech world. And if you're a human, sort of roaming is really good. But if you're a thing, it's not that quite great. It's, there's a problem. If you're a machine, the roaming is complicated. And that uh, brings us, uh, I'll touch on a few problems on that. So really the first thing, if we talk about those association cards, what do you think about roaming? You think about high costs. It's the first thing that sort of people worry about is those high costs. Poor performance if you're a machine because you know, data goes back to the host operator and can transverse the world. If you're a, uh, an AT&T sim you know, roaming in Australia, that data goes all the way back to the US and all the way back and runs across the world in undersea cables, comes back to you on your mobile phone or your device. So poor performance in roaming, it's quite a, it's quite a thing. Uh, and then we start off with what, whatever is here to, I talk about GDPR, whatever is here to protect us is also uh, quite a complication for us as well. Because, uh, you know, GDPR, if you're using a, a credit card machine and it's now roaming in different places, you're violating multiple problems uh, of GDPR regulations, not to mention data sovereignty and financial services, et cetera. So if you're a device, it's a little bit more complicated to roam. And then we start with permanent roaming. I don't know how many of you understand the concept. It's really there to protect the operators because the infrastructure really wasn't built for it. It's not just a commercial reason why the operators didn't want the, the permanent roaming to be there. The, they've built specific infrastructure. Roaming was really there for somebody to get off a plane, have a holiday, have a business trip for a week, and go back home. It wasn't built for millions of devices to sit on their network. Uh, and technically, it's a, it's a major problem. Uh, and security enforcement. So there's really a very little level of security that someone can implement 
when they're deploying a device in a roaming environment. And we can go into it if, if necessary, but I'll touch upon security in other, in other aspects. I jump on 30 years later from this 1992, we have this uh, Apple announcement. Whoever has an iPhone 14 is lucky enough to have seen that in the US at least, it's a SIM only environment. Uh, that means it's an eSIM environment and there's no SIM slot. Everybody understands this. Apple has pushed the boundaries here and said to the mobile operators, we're building a device with zero SIM slot. So there's no tray there. Uh, and it pushes the industry to a point where whoever's not implemented an eSIM environment, whoever's not got a profile in terms of a carrier, is not going to be able to sell uh, Apple as you know, it's one of the leading brands, so everybody wants to, and it's pushing the industry into this point. And I think, what does it mean for consumers? I think, uh, you know, an embedded eSIM only, I think the European ones have still a SIM slot, but it doesn't mean uh, it's not coming. The next versions are, are even in Europe, are going to be uh, an eSIM only. And it really gives the, the capabilities to, to download. And it's not just travel, you know, we said here, I mentioned your travel, but it's not really just the travel environment that we're talking about. It's really that flexibility. If I'm in an area, if you're in Australia, if you're in some certain parts of the US, even in the UK, if you're in Cornwall, you might want to be with one operator, not, the, not another. It's a capability to switch between SIMs, like switching between you know, email addresses on your drop-down menu. That's how easy it's going to be. And the connectivity based on local profiles will be significantly cheaper. Uh, Obviously, we have uh, roaming packages that we're all used to. We start buying roaming packages. I don't want to start a uh, Brexit uh, conversation, but uh, this is going to be the worst part of our sort of the Brexit things. People in the mobile world, you know, we're going to be hit with all these roaming issues again. And uh, we already see it. If you renewed your contract, you've seen that the operators are putting in every single little caveat. It's going to be a problem. Well. The one thing that we're going to see is if you've got this one of these eSIM phones, you're going to land in somewhere and buy a five pound voucher or a five euro voucher and get yourself a local number and still keep your, your applications, your comms application that you used to. So I think that's what's coming there. Now, I think what you're all thinking is what's this got to do with IoT? It's converging, it's pushing us into the boundaries of, of the eSIM world and why is it related to it? I think, as I said, this applying it will be very simple. So how does this all work and where, where, how does all, what has it got to do with IoT? And I think we're, what, we were, what we were always aiming for was to, to serve an enterprise customer, to serve, at the end of it, there is a business there that needs connectivity for its devices and the business really needs a global coverage and inherently, IoT is a global product. So when you're making a device, you're not really thinking, I want to sell it in one country. So the enterprise needs are always to have, a, to have global coverage, to have regulatory compliance. I said, you know, compliance doesn't just end with GDPR. It has financial services compliance in certain countries. It has security compliance in certain countries where you need to meet. It has a high performance needs. Uh, and when I say high performance, there's one thing that we we cannot accept anymore as uh, in the IoT space. Although I'm not, I'm not uh, knocking what happened in roaming. Roaming was part of our evolution to get to where we are. However, the customers sitting in front of enterprise customers, they demand a high performance network. Nobody can wait with an autonomous driving vehicle for uh, roaming to have a 400 millisecond response time because that car is going to be off the road by then. And, uh, there's a lot of anything that's really mission critical. You really need to have a high performance network and this is what the enterprise needs. I'll touch upon that again in, the, in, in a minute, how we got there. Guaranteed security, well, that's obviously, uh, you understand that if you're running data all across the world, it's hitting multiple, multiple, multiple uh, hubs along the way, same as where the internet hits and there's obviously no security there a single bill and multi-currency. So obviously one thing that you, you really need uh, as an enterprise, if you're working with uh, in 10 or 20 or 
more countries, you really need to work with one currency. Otherwise, you're, uh, you, you might want to run a hedge fund there uh, because you, it's going to be impossible to deal with. And I think that a lot of people who are, some of you who I know run some enterprise operations have come across this issue before. And new business models. Well, I guess, you know, IoT is completely different from the consumer world. Uh, new business models support, for example, having a device on the shelf for four months before it goes and starts uh, getting used or devices that are not being used once they're already started, uh, they're being deployed, but may be used once or twice and then sort of have a downtime of four or five months. Um, or perhaps they're merging between satellite and, uh, and cellular, so sometimes they're off the network. So business models, new business models need to, need to be in place. Whereas with mobile operators, mobile operators are local by nature. Uh, I've built three mobile operators in my life from scratch. The one thing in the DNA of a mobile operator is that it, it received uh, a, a spectrum for a specific geographic location and inherently you are exploiting your regional territory. So a mobile operator is, is local by nature. And as I said on the other slide, IoT is global. And when I we first started this business, there was two lines that, two sentences that uh, drove our, our vision. One was that IoT is global and MNOs are local. And the other one that plastic is dead. It was seven years ago, so maybe I'm a little bit too early and uh, some, some uh, would say that's the story of my life for these companies. Uh, but the structure is always structured for consumers. Everything we did, the high ARPU customers were a part of, uh, a part of the MNO's DNA. And for having suddenly an IoT consumer with very low ARPU and suddenly very different needs, different business models, you know, uh, contracts which are need to be flexible is something that the carrier didn't really have as well as the technical infrastructure for that. So that's supporting business model and obviously a carrier operates in one country and uses that single currency to, and this is the gap, we're in London so we're using mind the gap. How do we bridge the gap? And so there's various ways and this is sort of, we're going through some of the evolution and perhaps some of you sitting in this room are still using parts of this, but uh, this is how we, we evolved into where we're going with this. Uh, not necessarily our business, but definitely uh, the same across all the networks around. Integration overheads. Well, if you have multiple SIM cards and you're a manufacturer and you start uh, deploying uh, point of sale machines or tracking devices or uh, utilities, uh, meters or, or autonomous driving vehicles, some of the friends that we have that we've met today. Uh, the first thing is integration overhead. You're, you're, you're buying boxes. If you, some, some of you remember, you walk into some of the system integrators or the resellers and you suddenly have you know, 15, 20 boxes of mobile operators all across the floors and they're putting these in these devices and these in these devices and these are going to Poland and these are going to the US and these are going to Africa. And the complexity is that once you've put them in, you have to ship those, guy, those devices to, to each specific countries and that complication is, is very difficult. Obviously, it's a non-starter uh, non really when you're making a, a Mercedes car and you have to decide that you know, these specific 10 are going to Dubai and these specific 10 are going to London very difficult. The reliability obviously is due to the coverage gaps. You sometimes don't have this operator, or you have that operator, or you have one single operator in each country. And the capabilities, the actions, the state, the plans, each, each carrier has a different plan. This one carrier was selling a, a package of 10 megabytes for this amount and the other one was selling it for five and then the packages change and they're only good for 10 months or they're only good for a promotional period. All these things make it pretty much impossible for an enterprise uh, customer to deploy. And I think what happens is that these enterprise customers really became, uh, as experts, very similar to the roaming, uh, roaming managers in the mobile networks. They suddenly understood all the ins and outs. And it really, they started working in an environment that was uh, not natural for them, really uh, 
in, in a way they were wasting their effort trying to build the connectivity themselves. And I think that's what's driven part of this industry. And people think, why is it so complicated to have a SIM card for IoT specifically for these reasons? Uh, now we're looking at operator lock-in. So once you've put physical SIM cards in devices and you've deployed them, I'll give you examples of things that we are familiar with from the past. Solar panels with thousands of solar panels deployed on roofs and in, in a roaming environment with physical SIMs, and then they get shut down. You know, three years later, somebody shuts them down, the carrier doesn't have the same roaming agreement anymore, and physically to go and replace it was 10 times worse than, uh, it wasn't 10 times worse, it was 10 times the value of the contract uh, because it was extremely expensive, it's hundreds of dollars to go and replace each single uh, device. So replacing thousands of devices is, is a very dangerous scenario um, and it's really the big risk. The logistical overhead, as I was saying, the multiple shipping inventories, etc. A poor service and support. So you can imagine when you have a mobile phone and you're roaming for a holiday and you don't get a service, you call your host operator, the, the one who sold you the SIM from your hometown, and you say, well, it's not working. The best thing they could do is the next day maybe call the operator and try to understand with their roaming department. But if you've got 10,000 devices in the field, it's really a problem because the service is not going to be there. Nobody's really going to answer why do you have 10,000 devices sitting on my network is going to be the answer. It's not, let me help you. So, and the next, I guess the next level, where we said physical SIMs with multiple operators, the next level was roaming SIM. I think uh, many enterprise customers today, I'd say the majority, are still working on a roaming SIM environment. I think we had this chat uh, just before. Roaming SIM environment, well, you're still relying on, uh, on uh, on permanent roaming restriction, you still have these issues. They change every year, by the way. You know, operators once a year meet up and they and they start negotiating between them. And they can change the agreement. And if you've got SIMs in the field, you have an issue. So roaming is there, although perhaps you can still control it. You still have an issue of permanent roaming, and you still have uh, poor service and support. And that again goes back to the fact that mobile operators are consumer focused and you know they're working weekdays they're working nine to five different time zones you're going to find yourself in a very big problem if you've got a if you've got a problem uh, we talk about uh, financial aspects typically roaming is offline by nature it's uh, in many cases as fast as roaming uh, billing reconciliation goes it's 15 minute delayed tap files and that means that you're at best 15 minute delayed and that's if you're running the APIs, et cetera, and understanding uh, radius APIs, et cetera. But if you're, if you're just getting roaming SIMs, you're getting a bill at the end of the month, and, and that's about how you can deal with it. So again, uh, you may have solved the, the financial part of the, of the, of the currency, but you, you still have the offline nature of trying to understand where in today's world where we're really the financial services want to know exactly uh, what is costing? What's the customer costing? What's a, what's uh, you know trying to understand the, uh, you know how, what kind of service we're delivering? You really need to understand what is what's a, a, a device costing you in the field. Uh, operator lock-in. When I said ten thousand sims, well, now you're roaming and you've got one sim and you've deployed it across all your countries. So I said ten thousand. Go and replace a hundred thousand sim in multiple countries. That's even a more scarier, uh, a more scarier thought. By the way, all of these have happened to us. Have happened to our customers. Have happened to people that we've worked with, with manufacturers, with chipset manufacturers. Uh, I would say this is probably the largest risk of all the, uh, of everything else, because most of it you can deal with. You might get stung by a big bill at the end of the month, but going to change the devices, the sims of the devices, is a, is a very big mission. Uh, subpar performance, well. I'll put a little sort of brackets on this. Roaming always sends the data back to the host operator. That means that data could transverse all around the world to come back to me. If any of you are not from the UK, you, you have a roaming sim here, you're browsing, your data is going back to the host operator in most of the cases, 
and coming back to you here. It means it's pinged all around, and it means that you're really, when you're roaming, you're, you don't have priority compared to local customers on the network. And the network optimizes itself for, for its own use. It may optimize video in case of that. It may optimize uh, voice consumers. If there's too many people in one place, it'll optimize it and degrade the service for other aspects. You really cannot have that when you're running mission-critical devices. Now, it doesn't have to be uh, life-saving. It could be a credit card machine. But you know, if somebody can't uh, take payment, then it's mission-critical for their business. If somebody can't uh, track a, a, an ambulance, it's, it's critical for them or, or, or a device. You know, all these packages that were logistics and, and transport today is, is mission critical, pretty much in, in all aspects of it. And you cannot have a long latency or a delay or, for that matter, non-local IP addresses. Again, if you're with the roaming sims, chances are if you stick them into your laptop, you'll get the adverts, Google, everything around it will be from where the country that you bought that SIM from. And um, I was using a US SIM today to test something on my laptop. Immediately, everything came up as uh, Amazon US and you know uh, Google adverts from the US. So devices definitely don't can't deal with that. They don't have the performance. They don't have the um, and they don't have the the strength in the in the CPUs where Whereas uh, you know a new iPhone has a very strong CPU, uh, the the devices will typically are very low CPUs and really they cannot deal with all these uh, complexities. So they need local IP addresses. They need good performance, and also one more thing is the clocks. So sort of you know if you're using an IP address from a different from a different country, the clocks on your device will look for a time zone that's not there, and it could complicate the device itself. And uh, we're talking about uh, uh, no low power air wide area network support. So narrow band and CAT M1 uh, support. So this is sort of the, the, the bandwidth, the low bandwidth GSM support is typically seldomly in, in carrier roaming agreements. And it's been complicated. Uh, it's a complicated issue with, with the carriers we're dealing with at the moment. So. Uh, the last one is SIM profiles. This is where we're, we're heading off today. In actual fact, it's very similar. Uh, with SIM profiles, you're still, as an, as an enterprise, you're still dealing with multiple agreements. The fact that you're no longer putting a physical SIM inside your device, you're, you're downloading a, a, uh, an eSIM, that's fantastic because it's, it solves all the, the single SKUs, it solves the logistical, it solves that nightmare. But you're still dealing with multiple contracts from multiple operators, different capabilities. So each carrier uh, will have a different set of APIs, how to consume these eSIMs. Uh, they, one will have this platform, one will have another platform without using uh, different names. One will have a certain platform which you need to integrate with, and some will have certain capabilities on the APIs and some won't. So when you're building your uh, consumer-facing um, application, you have to take into consideration multiple platforms that you're integrating with. And when they are, every time they update their APIs, there's a complexity there. Uh, again, offline by nature, same thing here. Nothing's really changed except the plastic is no longer there. It's a lot better, but it's not there. Um, so we're looking at, um, if you work with an IoT service provider who relies on SIM profiles, there's a bit of less reliability, a bit of reduced visibility. It's better, but it's not there yet. Uh, again, it means there's a lot of work on your side to do. Um, going back to what we think about Apple and why is this driving, this is sort of loops back to my second slide. So why, was, why is Apple driving this IoT connectivity? Uh, because what we're trying to, to say in all of this is really that IoT devices need the same things as consumer devices. And this is why this is driving both, both sides of it, the IoT devices and the consumer devices. We all want good coverage now because we all want to have the eSIM. We all want to have low cost, both on the devices as well as the consumer devices. 
the simplicity of operation, well, now it's very easy. You change your, on your phone. You want to have the same on your device. So if you've deployed devices, you definitely want to be able to swap them. You definitely want to have swap a SIM, change a network, um, have the data sent to you via VPNs, etc. It's a lot more, there's a lot more need on the IoT side. On the consumer side, we want simplicity. Control, well, here the control is literally controlling which SIM I'm using. Here the IoT control is everything I was saying. I want a high performance network. I want to control where my what I'm seeing, which network I'm seeing now, which network I'm I, I want to use tomorrow. If this one fails, what if my device is offline? Will it wake up and go back to some network that I know that it worked in the past? Or can I inject another network from the past? Uh, and performance. Well, we definitely want performance and we understand that the roaming performance, it's good, but it's just not there. You know. Five years ago, we were really happy when we roamed and it just worked. Ten years ago. Now we have a bit more demand than that. When sort of operators are tethering our speed when we're roaming, I think it's sort of annoying everybody. You know, you're suddenly at an airport and you're trying to put something on, uh, on Google Maps or you're trying to watch something uh, and there's a problem. I think it's, it's starting. We're, we're not accepting that anymore. So this is why it's driving. Actually, we're driving to the same place and I think this is where... Yeah, at the end of it, localized coverage is the answer. And what we talk about localized coverage is going to lead us on to where we're seeing the industry is partly what I call one of these, the, the new super networks. These are really the, the infrastructure of the future for, for mobile. It's specifically running on for IoT devices, but it's at the same time it's running for any data device. Any data device that's using mobile, cellular, Connectivity, we uh, we call it. It's I, I I would like to call it the super network. What is it really? It is uh, it's the modern day infrastructure of mobile. Uh, modern day infrastructure of mobile is not individual mobile operators. It's really a single network that's spread around the world. There'll be several of these. They'll be driven by the clouds. They'll be driven. Uh, by various companies such as ourselves, but there's others. And these are the super networks really that are a single network with multiple POPs. When I say multiple POPs, I mean there's core network infrastructure uh, that we're used to from the, from the big uh, vendors. These are uh, packet gateways and core networks with localized support with uh, carrier operators in, in, uh, in various places around the world which provide a high performance network. And we believe that all of that is available to consume with one API to the enterprise customer. So really we believe that this is where the, the networks are going. This is what we're, or a lot of uh, ourselves as well as the other clouds are offering. We see this in, um, we see some uh, acquisitions by the big, uh, the public cloud, cloud providers uh, large pops of uh, data center suddenly popping up with core infrastructure around the world. As, so this means that a device lands somewhere in the world, it knows its pop, it knows it goes to the nearest network, and it gets the best service it can get. It gets local IP addresses, it gets local low ping times. I don't know what happened there. And it's consumed from one place. So local pops... Identical behavior, centrally built. Oh, this is something's going on here. Uh, centrally built with local pops, highly secure and consumed as a cloud service. So this is kind of how everything ties it for us around this Apple announcement and why we believe this is driven. It's pushing the industry. It's pushing the networks. It's pushing the vendors of the modems. It's pushing... Uh, it's, it's really pushing the whole industry just that one step further because really that profile and these eSIMs were available five years ago. It just took somebody to say, enough's enough. You know, uh, we no longer are going to ship around. And also, really, the environmental aspect of it is, is not negligible. I think that uh, in this day and age where we're, you know, we're trying to think about the environment a lot more, there's really... 
no need to start shipping around millions and millions of tons every single year. Perhaps, I don't, I don't know what the numbers are for, for Sims, but I would assume it's in the billions. I'm shipping billions of pieces of plastic, pretty much mostly in air freight around the world. It just doesn't make any sense. So I think this has definitely pushed us uh, to a new level. And um, yeah, that's it. That's my, uh, my little part of it. Um, hope you uh, found it interesting and happy to have any questions if you have anything. Well, companies are like us, uh, ourselves, this is not about our company, but companies such as ourselves build these uh, infrastructure networks, which means that we build core network infrastructure in multiple places around the world, in every continent, in every part of continents. If it's in the US, it's West Coast and East Coast. If it's in Asia, it's, yeah, it's in China, it's in different places, in Africa. And we build infrastructure, and we partner with the local network to get their SIM card identities authenticated on our infrastructure, which means it's not reliant on the operator's infrastructure. And it, it relieves the operator, actually, of, of this problem. The operators really are quite happy to cooperate with networks such as ourselves because it, it relieves them of that burden. They have no... They want to continue serving the consumer customers. They're quite happy to provide us the infrastructure, they still get paid for it, except it doesn't sit on their infrastructure. So if you think this is, this is really the modern day cables under the sea, there's no, this is the modern day um, New York to London uh, subsea cables that provided telephony and, and the internet. Uh, there's no difference between this. This is railroad infrastructure for the mobile world. And if we all, just look around us at the number of uh, applications that we're using from the utilities to tracking to medical to agriculture. To, we understand that there's hundreds of use cases in each one of them and the number of devices, uh, the number of devices is, is by far surpassing the number of consumer handsets, except they're not really a valuable device from a, from a service provider's point of view, like a carrier. The, the ARPUs is low, the, 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 you're still using resources, you're still using billing infrastructure that was built for consumers, you're still using signaling gateways that were built for consumers. The one thing that you're, one thing that modern networks are using is the air interfaces, the towers that are already there and are quite happy to serve a low bandwidth device. So this is really an infrastructure play and it really is the modern day network for uh, infrastructure. Sim as I say, it's very, very similar. If you look at the last hundred years, it's really very similar to the copper that was laid in the sea. The modern day networks are interconnected. They're consumed by cloud. They're, they're completely uh, uh, built on, on containers. So you can take little parts here and put them in that cloud. But if you really need them closer, to your enterprise, you can build parts of that network closer to your ERP systems or your IT environment. It depends what is the consumption. But for example, I'll give an example of, uh, of utilities. You know, the one thing that's being attacked today uh, by hackers or by governments, or uh, not that I have any political stand view on this, but is, is utilities, electro el electricity systems, water systems. It's a very, it's, it's, a, natural, it's a national security risk that your electricity meters are going to be uh, attacked or switched off or something like that. So mobile private networks are springing up, which are very similar to what I'm, we were suggesting here, where you put the core network infrastructure very close to the, in, the IT environment of the electricity company or the water company, et cetera, and you're mitigating the internet there's no internet, there's this completely a mobile network with no internet connectivity. And we have built such a, a network for uh, a utility, and we're building more now, uh, and we see a lot of that. So this is what is a mobile private network 
where you can consume things in, in a closed environment. But if you need to, if your device needs to leave, it can also handshake to the public RAN, as we call it. If that Does that answer the question? Is that good enough? I, I have more questions. But Happy to have it. OK, fantastic. Um, anyone else? Yes, yes please. Sorry, it's a technical question. Yes. Um, Um, some of the things I'll say off off the stage, but that, but that we are pr the, the main difference between us and, and everybody else is we're we're an infrastructure company, and the connectivity is a layer of service that we provide. At the end of the day, uh, again, this is not presentation about flow. Uh, we're flow is an infrastructure player, an infrastructure company. We're not an IoT connectivity provider. Yes, we provide it as one of the services, but we also provide billing and we also provide security and rules. It's one of the layers of, uh, and it's not part of our business model. The connectivity is not part of our business model. Uh, we're an infrastructure player and we, uh, IoT, other IoT service providers, mobile operators are, are also using our infrastructure. So it's not, we're not using it just for our own customers. Um, Flow also provides this infrastructure to mobile carriers, to groups of mobile carriers, uh, some of the tier ones, and to other service providers. So this is an infrastructure play. The connectivity is, is a service. It's part of the applications that we provide. But I'm happy to have a, a more of an in-depth uh, conversation about that. Well, yeah, go ahead. Well, we would provide you with with a profile that would would will find itself on our network, uh, and then it would download the correct uh, IMSI, which will attend to that device. So it'll be the best place. Uh, let's say you're in Africa, it'll download the right carrier. We have multiple carriers in Africa, but it'll download the best one for that business case that you've predefined, like I want number, that would be number one, but if it's not, that would be number two. If it's not, that would be number three. And if it loses connectivity and it's down for two hours or three hours, um, abort everything, restart the device, restart the SIM, and go to a, you know, a carrier that's outside of Africa that will just get connectivity. Because really, the last thing we, we as we were saying, the last thing you want to do is go out and look for it. So. Yeah, you don't need to look for our infrastructure. Plus, our infrastructure will connect to the closest infrastructure of ours. So in a multiple node network like this, uh, the, the closest packet gateway will serve that device. But if it fails, it's, that's not the end of the game. It will still go to a, a packet gateway that's a little bit further away. It might be you know, in the East Coast, in the US, but now for some reason there's a a fail in the internet connectivity between the device, between that packet gateway and the signaling, it might go to the West Coast. Or if you're in Asia, it might go to our Hong Kong pop, but it might not, it might go to one of the other pops in, in Asia. So that's what I was trying to explain, maybe London or Frankfurt or uh, whatever. So uh, they're all interconnected and all getting served, but the device just needs to have an identity on it that we can, that can find, so it's an eSIM with one profile. Yes, on our core network. How many pops do you have all around the world right now? More than 30. 30. And so let's say I'm in Uganda, let's say. And you It'll connect to our Kenyan one. You're, you're connected to your Kenyan one. So yeah. there's still the data will be going from Kenya to 
from Uganda to Kenya. So Kenya yeah. can go to their partner. And from the signaling, it will go from the signaling of the tower to our uh, pop in in Kenya and will and will receive. The authentication will it happen initially in in, in Uganda or? It will happen in in Kenya on the core network, but it'll be a lot closer. It'll be a lot closer, and it will be with an IMSI of a carrier that's allowed to permanently roam in Uganda. Otherwise, I, otherwise we won't provide the service. If we can't meet that, we won't provide you a service. Uh, so, but if it's on the West Coast, we have uh, Nigeria, for example. West Coast of Africa, we have Nigeria. If you're in South Africa, we'll offer you. You know, so it'll depend. You know, also a lot of the things that we took into consideration are. What are, the, what are the cabling systems? Which countries have the best uh, infrastructure? And it's constantly building. I can't say that this network is complete. It's a constantly, it's an evolution. It's where the, where the needs are. It's, it's, it's blowing with the customers, really. Um, different use cases are driving this. You know, uh, um, set-top box TVs or uh, cars or whatever, whatever is really <coughs> driving the the customers, that's where we're building the infrastructure. Um, it's a growing infrastructure, it's constant growing. But it's an evolution, it's a very, it's a very interesting, I think, evolution of the ESIM. I think we're, we're very happy to be living at this point in time and not 30 years ago. Um, and I think the opportunities are endless with this. It's, it's really opening up now. It's really becoming affordable, it's really opening up. I think the the pioneers of industry, and I'm saying it from the enterprise side, not on my side, the, the, the businesses that really worked on this and struggled through it, um, well, they're, they're, that's the reason that innovated the industry. Otherwise, we would not be here with it. Uh, and if people gave up on this, but a lot of customers really failed. They spent a lot of money trying to get to where they are on this. Um, perhaps, you know, your story as well. You know, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of challenges that come to to getting to where you are with global connectivity. If once if you're in one country and you have one product, you could have survived it without getting uh, getting hurt. But so I have said earlier, you know, we're in 54 countries. So yeah, so even more. Yeah. <laughs> so you must have some yeah. some some pains. Yeah. Well, we provide the we provide the VPN from our packet cores, um, so we would provide uh, and the VPNs directly from us. It has nothing to do with the carrier. Uh, the carrier doesn't get involved in the in the data at all. So the data doesn't pass the carrier. It touches our packet core, and for uh, for larger customers who are who are quite. Um, intend to have control of that, we would place the packet core in their environment. So actually, by into your yeah, system. or we could build your, a packet core inside your NOC. Uh, I would touch no, nothing else. But that's the modern day network in, in all of this. Well, thank you very much. It's been, uh, been great. Um, I hope, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll see you on the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.